The ghost hunters who captured this image at Sheffield General Cemetery in the UK believe it to be the spirit of Catherine Parker, a merchant's wife who hanged herself over 170 years ago. Hello, and welcome to Strange Times number 28. And looking at that image of Catherine as a ghost, it appears she's opted for that classic ghost look with the full sheet cover, <laughs> with the full sheet covering. And a bit of a glow there too. You can't beat the classics. Man, you guys owe me for this one. It is so hot this morning. It's got to be getting close to 30 degrees already. It's so humid. I'm sitting here. I don't have any air con. I'm suffering for you. Sitting here in my jocks. Sweating like a... I don't know. I don't think... Do pigs sweat? But I'm sweating, I can tell you that. So hopefully I can make this one as quick as possible without too many mistakes. So first up, I've got a story about some suppressed documents in Scotland. Continued secrecy over famous Scottish UFO case. Back in August 1990, two hikers who had been walking the Scottish Highlands near Calvine, Pitlochry, witnessed a strange diamond-shaped object hovering over the nearby landscape. They managed to capture images of the UFO before it sped off at significant speed. Keen to get the word out about what they had seen, the pair got in touch with the Scottish Daily Record newspaper and shared both their story and the photographs they had taken. Journalists then shared the images with the UK Ministry of Defence. It turned out that the hikers had not been the only ones to see the object. A RAF Harrier jet pilot had also witnessed the phenomenon, again near Clavine, after being scrambled to investigate. Quote, the Defence Intelligence staff sent these images to JAR, J-A-R-I-C, that's the Joint Air Reconnaissance and Intelligence Centre, said former MID UFO investigator Nick Pope. He continues... Now, this is the UK's military centre of expertise when it comes to imagery analysis. These intelligence personnel came to the conclusion that these photographs are real, that it's a solid craft, and no one had the faintest idea what it was. Close quote. Thirty years on, and the MOD dossier, including the photographs, had been scheduled for declassification and public release, as is typical for such documents. Now, however... For reasons unknown, the release has been postponed for another 50 years. What a crock of shit. Quote, Under the 30-year rule, the file should have been released on January 1st, 2021. But if the ministry get their way, it won't be released until January 1st, 2072. An 82-year closure. Close quote. So I wonder what they're trying to hide there. Because those diamond-shaped crafts, they're kind of interesting. I can remember when I was a kid, like a really young kid, there was a bit of a hoo-ha in the local town. And apparently uh, reported in the paper was a this great big diamond-shaped craft that came and hovered uh, in this area. At the time, it was, wasn't that populated. Um, now it's all, it's a great big built up area, but back then it was, there was like a, a wetland and apparently this diamond shaped craft just came down and hovered over this wetland and then took off. That's all I can remember about it. I would love to, to have a dig through, uh, some local archives, see if there's any, any report. I think we all know I'm not actually going to do that. I'm too lazy, but it would be cool. And don't forget about the, Cash Landrum case, where that they witnessed that diamond-shaped UFO, which was um, escorted by helicopters, and they copped some serious burns. And I believe that sighting was around the same time that this that this UFO sighting in my hometown occurred, sort of around the same years. So I wonder if there was some sort of testing of some sort of new technology throughout the like Western allied nations. Anyway, let's move on. This next one is just something totally random. I thought you might find it interesting. People from Australia might be interested in this. 
It's a venomous plant. As if Australia wasn't home to enough poisonous critters, even some of its trees are capable of stinging you, thanks to fine hairs on their leaves that deliver a potent neurotoxin. One notable example, Dendrochnide excelsa, or the Gimpy Gimpy, can be found in the rainforests of northeast Australia. Those unfortunate enough to brush up against it with bare skin can expect an intense burning, followed by the sensation of having one's hand slammed in a car door. <laughs> what, a, what a description. The pain is so bad that it can sometimes last days or even weeks in extreme cases. Now, according to a new study involving an analysis of the tree's molecular structure, scientists have discovered that its toxins are not dissimilar to those produced by spiders and scorpions. The venom itself is not like, that's not with a K, meaning that it can repeatedly target the victim's pain receptors. Fantastic. That would be in Australia too, wouldn't it? I've been stung by stinging nettles, and they suck, but this sounds really bad. The stinging nettles don't give that hand slammed in a car door feeling, I can tell you, but... It does suck. It's like a burning. Probably everyone's got stinging nettles. I think they're pretty spread out throughout the world. But yeah, this gimpy gimpy, that sounds bad. I wonder why everything in Australia is so poisonous. Okay, now I've got a couple of stories for you. Reality distortions. This happened on Monday, April 3rd, 2000, in the Okefenokee swamp in southeast Georgia. On our way to Florida from our home in Michigan at the time, we stopped at the Suwannee Canal Recreation Area. While there, we decided to rent a motorboat and go up the canal to a picnic area for lunch. The waterway is on a meandering canal. Conditions were low and trashy. That's my condition. That's my style, actually. Low and trashy. So there was no chance of getting lost on any of the small tributaries because there was no way of getting through. The canal was fairly wide and easy to follow. We enjoyed the dark and mysterious water and the moss-draped cypress of this ancient swamp. But then we noticed that it seemed to be taking a very long time to go the few miles or so to the picnic area. We finally made it and walked on the trembling earth to the picnic area. And I just want to make note of that term trembling earth that she uses here and I'll get back to it. I definitely made sure to note which way to go upon leaving the picnic spot. After lunch, as we were preparing to push off, two young men approached us in another motorboat. They were in a distressed state and asked if they could follow us back to the concession. They said they could not get through. We agreed to allow them to follow us. I had observed that they did not appear to be drunk. I'll just quickly note here that, I mean, it's not really, it doesn't take away from the story too much, but I don't know if I mentioned in the intro, but this, the woman who's telling this story is recalling the story from when she was seven years old. So that seems like a bit of a, I don't think a seven year old, well, maybe they could tell if an adult's drunk, but. It just seems like a strange... I think she's adding that to give more credence to her story. After about 30 feet, and I think this 30 feet's a typo because 30 feet is not far. That's like a... that's 10 meters. That's a few steps. And so she says, After about 30 feet, we came to a stop because our way was blocked by a strip of dry land with tall grass growing on top. I could see the canal continuing beyond the barrier. We considered portaging over it, but concluded it was not a good idea in the wild swamp. I even touched the side of the bank, and it was solid. We looked back at the other two guys, and they just shrugged their shoulders. We could do only one thing, and that was to go back to the picnic area to see if we could have possibly veered off course, and we had not. On the way back, we passed an elderly couple paddling a canoe in the direction of the barrier. I tried to warn them about the blockage ahead, 
but they only kept their focus ahead with no acknowledgement, as if we were not even there. Ah, oh, hang on, I just realised something too as I... I just scrolled down a little bit. It's the next story that the girl is seven years old, not this one, so I take back my comments. I really should re-record it, but... It's alright. When we reached the picnic area, we decided to try again. This time we not only had no barriers in the way, but we seemed to have gotten there very quickly. Those two guys got out of their boat and peeled rubber in the parking lot before I could even discuss this event with them. The people at the concession were no help as far as information on others experiencing similar problems either. Alright, so in further information to this, they talk about how the witness is aware of tussocks, and tussocks are, in swamps, they refer to drifting masses of herbaceous plants. They can range in size from a few feet across to hundreds of acres. Floating islands a phenomenon similar to tussocks, are formed from peat, mud and plants and can sometimes support trees of up to 50 feet tall and 12 inches in diameter. And so I bring that up because they're talking about the, the possibility that the dry piece of grassland that they ran into could possibly have been a tussock. But if you remember, earlier in the story, she says that she finally made it to the picnic area and that they walked on the trembling earth of the picnic area. So that to me sounds like it itself is a tussock or a floating island, and that while they were enjoying their picnic, the islands actually moved, you know, to a different location in the swamp. That's what I reckon's happened here. And when they travelled back to the picnic area, it had moved again, possibly, you know? So I don't know if that is a reality distortion or just a tussock. Okay, on to the next one. This one is also out on the water, somewhere in the middle of nowhere. It's called The Siren Song. It was 1987. I was just a girl. My mum and dad took my sister and I upstream in a flat-bottom fishing boat on the Saline River in south-central Arkansas. Gotta thank Arlene for the uh, correction on the pronunciation of that. I used to call it Arkansas. The idea was to motor up where people didn't go and tie off in the middle to fish. We went a mile or more from the camp and tied off where a tree was laid over the river. As soon as a hook was dropped in the water, the boat began vibrating. Not harshly, just subtly. And we could hear this song. By song, I don't quite know how to explain, but there were no words. And it was the most beautiful sound I have ever heard in my life. The boat vibrated with a melody. The three of us thought it must be coming from under the water. But my dad was not so sure. He pulled over to the east bank and got out looking around the woods. Then we went to the west bank. He climbed up the embankment to see an open field. But he never found anything to explain the sound. The longer we were there, the more profound the vibrations became. Again... I've got to say, it was the most beautiful sound I have ever heard. We may have been there 10 to 15 minutes, just long enough for Dad to be afraid of the unknown, by not finding an explanation. So we left and never came back. The sound was steady flowing with melody. There were no breaks in the sound or the boat vibrations, but it did get stronger or louder the longer we were there. It was all higher notes, maybe mid to high notes. There were no low notes. There were no distinct sounds. It was just flowing like a song. No pauses, just awesome and scary and intriguing all at the same time. And so without actually witnessing this myself, my initial thoughts, probably like a few of you guys, would be that it's... Like she didn't mention if there was wind, because wind can make some pretty strange sounds. And the fact that the boat was vibrating, you know, maybe there was a breeze whistling through some of the rigging or something. You know, it could have been, could have been the wind passing over the rope that they'd used to tie off onto the tree, or even the fishing line. Sometimes a fishing line will make this strange 
uh, eerie sort of sound if it's windy. So that's my initial thoughts, but I wasn't there. And so she says that it was, it sounded unnatural. So, you know, I'm open to it. Oh, actually, I just thought of something else too. Uh, maybe the fact that the father uh, moved the boat to the east and west bank and could still hear the sound, that kind of blows my idea out of the water that it was just uh, the wind vibrating the <coughs> the rope or the, the fishing lines. But anyway, let's move on, shall we? And here we have the final story for the day, and it's a good old alien abduction. Abduction in the jungle. In March of 1978, a fisherman was out by a river in the state of Maranhão, Brazil, when his concentration was broken by screams from the nearby jungle. Alarmed, the fisherman stopped what he was doing and ventured into the thick, murky underbush towards the desperate cries, until he came to a teenaged boy lying there upon the ground. The boy seemed to be in rough shape, unable to move, and even when asked who he was, he could only respond with gurgled cries of, of pain. Whoever the boy was, he seemed to be in some sort of spaced out daze. And considering there was blood coming from his mouth, the fisherman assumed that he had been attacked by someone. When authorities arrived, the boy was taken to the hospital and it was found that he had four missing teeth, with other teeth jagged and broken patches of hair that appeared to have been singed off, and some kind of red marks like sunburn around the ears. And by the time doctors looked at him, he was in some sort of unresponsive, catatonic state. He was moved to a more modern medical facility, and only after a few days did he begin to come out of his mysterious stupor. When he did, he had quite a bizarre tale to tell, and so would begin one of the weirdest alien abduction accounts Brazil has ever seen. It started as a normal day for 16-year-old Luis Carlos Serra, who in March of 1978 was out in the wilds near his home in the village of Penalva, collecting guava fruit for his family. The area was covered in thick jungle, but he had been out here many times before, and for Louis it was all rather mundane. That is until the day he began to take... Drugs. Just jokes. <laughs> that is until the day began to take a turn for the strange, starting with a loud noise like a siren that boomed out to reverberate among the trees. This was not a normal sound of the jungle, obviously not natural, and at first Louis thought it might be from an aircraft overhead, but when he looked up it would prove to be no normal airplane. When Louis peered up through the canopy of the trees stretching far above, he felt nearly blinded by an intensely bright light. What was causing the light he could not see, but it was so brilliant that it lit up the normally dim jungle floor, and as he stood there, frightened and wondering what could possibly produce such a light, he suddenly found that he could not move his body. Louis would claim later that something had paralysed him, and he fell to the ground, unable to move or even cry out. As he lay there helpless, the light began to sort of congeal around him until he was enveloped by it, and that was when he felt his body lift off the forest floor into the air, as if something was pulling him upwards. The now terrified boy continued his ascent, right up through the branches of the canopy and above the sea of the jungle green, and that's when he finally saw the source of the light. According to Louis, hovering over the jungle was a large round object with a domed top and lined by windows along its side, and it was towards this inscrutable craft that he found himself floating. He would claim that he was pulled towards the mysterious sphere and right through one of the windows until he was inside of it. He was then allegedly gently lowered to the floor, from which Louis looked up to see three humanoid beings in metallic suits and visors, standing around him speaking in some unknown language. He tried to comprehend what was going on, and the craft began to move. Things would get even stranger still. Although his memory of the events would remain somewhat murky, 
He says the craft went to a place that was dark and devoid of mountains. There was no sky or stars or trees. Just a vast expanse of some sort of strange tall grass and nothing but blackness above. He was levitated back out of the craft and set down upon a flat rock in a clearing. And this is what he said happened. I was taken to a strange land with no trees and only with tall grass. I do not know how long it took to get there. I went out the window just as I came in, with nothing supporting my back. I was still paralysed. It was a strange place that I did not know. It seemed like a field, but there were no birds or no edges to the field. The grass was very high, about one metre. I did not see any house or buildings. I couldn't see the sky, and there were no trees or stars. It was very dark. I was still paralysed. So those people approached me and put a tube in my nose. It didn't hurt. Then they put a transparent ball in my mouth and a liquid down my throat so fast. I fell asleep and did not know what happened later. Then I woke up in the bush. It would not be until three days later that he would be found there by the fishermen. But it would turn out that there had been an intensive search effort to locate the boy carried out by the villagers. So yeah, that's pretty weird, I guess. His description doesn't explain the smashed teeth, though. I wonder what happened there. Maybe when they put the transparent ball in his mouth. Or maybe they dropped him from the aircraft. They couldn't be bothered lowering him back down to his, uh, his home location. It is a pretty strange story. And so I guess I'll just leave it there and I will bid you all farewell and have a great week and see you next time. See ya.